Chapter Seven of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The idea that all good things come from the unseen beneficence we call God has been slow in making its way in the world. Like all ultimate truth, it is too large to be seen in its entirety, too far reaching to be appreciated by beings engrossed in the small affairs of daily living. So, Although Miss Malvina Bennett had caught more than an occasional gleam of the universal effulgence, she was none the less perturbed when a vigorous shaking of a lank flour bag failed to dislodge more than a scant cupful. Can't set no bread today, she muttered, and ma hates store bread like poison. A like thorough and drastic investigation revealed the emptiness of the various showy packages ranged along her pantry shelves. "'Well, I declare,' muttered Miss Malvina. "'I ain't never been so put to it since I begun to sew for a living. "'I don't wonder Ma's fractious. "'She needs a good meal of warm victuals to enliven her up, "'and there ain't a bean of coffee neither.' "'Hastily she reviewed the meagre list of her possible resources. "'Their solitary hen, when inspected, ruffled her feathers sulkily. "'The light rime of snow on the ground outside had evidently furnished no incentive to lay. "'You need company,' said Miss Malvina sympathisingly. "'I'm a-going to let you set just as soon as I can afford a dozen real eggs. Then maybe we'll have some nice young pullets come fall, and maybe a real handsome rooster crow in the mornings.' With this vague promise, she scattered a sparse handful of corn and retreated toward the house. "'There's just three things I can do,' she reflected, as she swept the snow from her front steps, oblivious to the magical splendour of the budding maples laden with pearl and ermine, through which the sun was darting jealous arrows, I can go down to the store and risk having Obed Salter tell me he won't trust me no more, or I can go to the parsonage and ask the minister right out for the money on Philura's wrapper. Oh, but I will say I'd hate to do that. Maybe he wouldn't be up yet. And what on earth would he think of me traipse into his house before breakfast, with Philura in bed and all? I suppose I could take that there robe back to Miss Hobbs. It's all done as well as I can make out with it. Don't fall to pieces first thing, anyhow. I suppose she'll find out who I be sooner or later, and other folks will too. But I ain't going to let Ma starve not as long as I can hold a needle. She was on the point of retreating indoors when the sight of a slim figure speeding along the magical vista arrested her on the threshold. "'Bon matin, Miss Malvina,' cried a fresh young voice. "'What happiness to see all this beauty! It is most spirituel, like what you call heaven, n'est-ce pas?' "'How's your pa feeling this morning?' inquired Miss Malvina. "'I thought I'd just step in to inquire after breakfast and see if there wasn't something I could do.' The little dressmaker drew the black and white plaid shawl closer under her chin and stood smiling down at the girl. She could see her very distinctly, even without her far-seeing glasses, in the clear white light of the morning, and she was thinking vaguely that the vivid face upturned to hers was like no other face she had ever seen. Merci one thousand, chère Miss Malvina. Mon papa is quite recovered after sleep. I have made already le déjeuner. Also, I find the shop. See, I bring compliments of my papa to Madame votre mère. We don't keep a horse, said Miss Malvina, shaking her head. The girl was eagerly extending a basket. No, I not understand. But for your déjeuner, oui? Oh, I'm afraid I don't catch on to your kind of talk. You ought to learn English. You want I should take this here basket? The girl smiled and nodded, with a glint of white teeth between red lips. Then she consulted a small book dangling from her belt. See, at all times I study l'anglais. I tell you very quick. A compliment, the same, of mon père, my father, to votre mère, your mother. Voilà. Uh, you have it, n'est-ce pas? Goodbye. You come again quick. Oh, for land's sake, 
ejaculated Miss Malvina, as she investigated the contents of the basket in the privacy of her kitchen. "'Them folks are going to be real good neighbours. I can see that already. I only fetched em over two eggs last night, and here's six, and as much as a pound of butter, and goodness knows what all in these here jars.' Over a slim bottle of suspicious aspect and many-worded foreign labels, Miss Malvina shook her head. Hmm, I'm afraid it's some sort of intoxicating liquor, she said, sniffing gingerly at the seal. Maybe I'd better take it back and tell em first thing that Ma and me belongs to the WCTU. In the end, she decided to stow the bottle out of sight in the gloomy recesses of the upper pantry shelf. "'Twon't do no harm up there,' she told herself strongly. "'But you wouldn't catch me giving it to Ma, even if she was at death's door.' Half an hour later, Miss Malvina, her best frizzed front inherited from her grandmother, pinned firmly over her white curls, and her small figure enveloped in a stiffly starched gingham apron, stood knocking at Philura Rice's back door. She still thought of the erstwhile vacant house as belonging to the wife of the minister, as did everyone, Miss Philura Rice had married the Reverend Silas Pettibone three years before, to the amazement, not to say consternation, of the village of Innisfield, which had long since relegated the modest little lady to the limbo of protracted maidenhood. My, cogitated Miss Malvina to herself, how many, many times I run in here to borrow a spoon of bacon powder or like that off Philura, and when Genevieve and Gregory lived here too. But the house wa not big enough for them after twins was born. And of course Miss Mortimer Van Duza wanted em in Boston, where she could see em every day. I never seen a woman meller up the way she done after those babies. She paused to once more apply her knuckles in a brisk rat-tat on the closed door. Like enough they're making such a racket moving furniture they can't hear me, she told herself. I can see one thing. There ain't been a rag laid to them windows, and it's all a body can do to see through em what with dust and cobwebs. Then all at once she became aware of the approach of slippered feet within. The door was opened on a cautious crack, and a bearded face looked out. It was the man she had seen the night before. Miss Malvina blushed like a girl as she recalled the touch of his lips on her rough little fingers but it seemed suddenly impossible to explain her presence on the back door steps. For an instant she meditated flight. "'Ah, good morning,' said the man. "'You wish to enter?' Miss Bennet brightened. "'I just run over to help round a spell,' she said eagerly. "'I guess she was most too sick last night to take notice of who was doing for you. "'It was real kind to send them things over to Ma.' She ate a real good meal of victuals for the first time, and I don't know when. It done her good. Different things, you know, and like that. The man opened the door wide, and with a courteous gesture bade the little dressmaker enter. He was smiling, and his eyes, very clear and dark, again swept the small figure. Oh, you have the wish to see my daughter, Nespa. She has gone out in search of an ouvrière. For the moment I cannot perceive the word. Of a possibility you can inform me. You can search me, said Miss Malvina. Why under the sun didn't she wait till I come over? Maybe I could have made out what it was you wanted. I have lived here since I was knee eye to a grasshopper. The man had bent his head with grave attention. Your language, he said, is most engaging. Never do I weary of its study. But, naturellement, I speak more readily than I can comprehend. You will pardon me, I have the hope. Oh, sure I will, said Miss Malvina with dignity. Tain't really your fault, you're foreign, and I think you speak quite nice. <laughs> I see your windows ain't been cleaned. Suppose I whirl in and wash em for you. I fetch some cleaning cloths along, as I says to Ma, they won't have none, tain't likely. Ah, an ouvrière? But surely I am mistaken. Do you not live in the adjoining house? Oh, certainly I do. Me and Ma Bennett. 
I'm a dressmaker by trade, and generally I don't have time to clean my own windows. But this spring I ain't so busy as usual, so I got time to burn. Time to burn. <laughs> he smilingly shook his head. I am very academic, I fear, but I shall perhaps improve. In the interval, you will obligingly excuse? Oh, guess I'll have to, <laughs> chirruped Miss Malvina. And I won't say I don't find it kind of enjoyable. You're being foreign and, so to say, different from folks around here. Never had Miss Malvina felt more dignified and at ease. The man's gentle air of deference, his grave attention to everything she said, had somehow soothed her wounded pride. Her faded eyes sparkled. She even raised a careful hand to Grandmother Bennett's legacy. It was composed of tightly frizzed and very black hair mounted on a net foundation, and it concealed very completely the feathery snow-white hair beneath. Miss Malvina had blanched early, but with the aid of the artificial front, designed for a larger head than her own, it had been possible to keep the knowledge of the fact from the general public. She was glad she had worn it this morning instead of her everyday one, which had faded with the years to a singular greenish tint. Let me see, she went on. I had a regular introduction to you last night, but what with your being so upset, if not really delirious, and me flying around like hen with her head cut off trying to get some supper so you'd eat a bite, I clean forgot what it was. <laughs> her new neighbour shook his head regretfully. Again I accomplish my ignorance, he said. You will repeat, in words more simple, is it not? I forgot your name, said Miss Malvina. Mine's Miss Malvina Bennett. Ah, Miss Malvina Bennett. But I hastily make my introduction. My name, it is De Say, Etienne De Say, and very much at your service, Miss Malvina. You possess the good heart. My land, I ain't done nothing to speak of, protested the little dressmaker. Here comes Madeline now. I bet I can find out what she's been after before you can spell Jack Robinson. Madeline, colourful as a flower, ran up to Miss Malvina with a little cry of pleasure, and stooping her slim young body, touched first one faded cheek and then the other with her warm red lips. Gracious me! exclaimed the astonished recipient of these favours. I don't know when anybody's kissed me before since I was knee-eye to a grasshopper. You two certainly do beat the Dutch. You ain't no more like Innisfield folks than the moon's like green cheese. Now, Madeline, I think I got that right. I want you should tell me what you've been looking for, and then we'll get to work. I certainly do enjoy gassing as well as the next one. But polite conversation don't saw no wood. The process by which Miss Malvina was led to understand the significance of the word ouvrière was a tortuous one and involved the use of French and English lexicons, as well as a search through the popular phrase-book that Marilyn carried at her belt. "'What a ridiculous name for a washwoman!' she exclaimed, when at last light broke upon her bewildered mind. Oh, "'But I can tell you, there's scarce of an hen's teeth this spring. Let me see. Miss Wessels is at the parsonage, and will likely stay there for a spell, on account of Mrs. Reverend Pettibone's baby.' You get to know her real well once she gets round again. She owns this here house, and she's the greatest little woman. She can tell you all about how to get anything you want out of the surrounding atmosphere. She got her husband that way, and all the best clothes. But I don't know, I ain't had so much luck myself. Oh, now I guess we'll tackle this here kitchen first off. And if your pa can make out to do a little unpacking, we'll soon have things shipshape. And even if I can't make out all you say, actions certainly do speak louder than words. And I guess you'll find I ain't afraid to whirl in and work if I ain't a regular, what you'll em call em, going out with a day. By noon, shining windows, clean paint and vigorously scrubbed floors attested the genuineness of Miss Malvina's professions, 
while the new proprietors of Miss Philura's abandoned dwelling showed themselves equally expeditious and resourceful. Indeed, Miss Bennett, in one of her flying trips across the yard in quest of a fresh supply of window rags, reported to Ma progress of an astonishing character. They ain't got such an awful lot of stuff, she said, but I bet you'll be surprised to see their parlour. Don't look a speck like any other room in town. First thing Mr. Dessay done was to fix a lot of books on shelves, and she whips up some handsome lace curtains to the windows before I could get em good and polished. <laughs> they got pictures, too, and queer kinds of vases and like that, and rugs. You ought to see them rugs, thick as a board and all colours. Kind of mixy, I thought. I'd rather lay down a good red and black ingrain myself with a layer of straw in under it to keep the wind off of your feet. But being foreign, I suppose they don't know no better. They even hung up some of them rugs on the walls. Oh, I had to laugh. Late that afternoon, the little dressmaker stood looking about her at the rooms so swiftly transformed from dreary emptiness to snug comfort, albeit of a singular and foreign sort, hitherto unknown in Innisfield. Well, it was lucky for you folks I once a drove in my shop as usual, she said complacently. And I will say it looks real nice, upstairs and down. Not that I ever heard of such a thing as hanging up goods by the yard on the walls with brass-headed tacks. <laughs> but this here blue and white stripe certainly does look pretty with Madeline's white furniture. And the red's real cheerful in your pa's room. But I got to go now and get Ma's supper before she gets fractious. Cher Miss Malvina, said the girl, one thousand times we are obliged. But you will permit? You will not be offend? She glanced appealingly at her father. We wish, with our thanks, to also make the reward suitable, said Monsieur de Say, with a propitiatory smile. You will permit, is it not? He produced from his waistcoat pocket a small white envelope, which he handed to Miss Malvina, with a courteous bow. She opened it to find within a neatly folded banknote. Just why Miss Malvina should have experienced a shock of bitter resentment at the sight of money so hardly earned and so sorely needed furnishes a psychological problem of considerable interest. She was in the habit of earning money by the labour of her hands. Then why not this money? Was there, one might inquire, any real difference between plying the needle and the scrubbing brush? That there was a difference, wide and deep, was evidenced by Miss Malvina's unpremeditated behaviour on this occasion. "'Sakes alive!' she cried, her small figure quite rigid with indignation. "'The simple idea of trying to pay me for what I'd done, like I was Louisa Wessels and Mrs. Jabez Trimble. I come over to do for you folks friendly, because you was neighbours, and because—' Something very like a sob choked further utterance, but Miss Malvina managed clearly to convey her utter repudiation of the idea of recompense by casting the envelope and its contents at the feet of the man who had offered it. I have you to understand I don't go out by the day except to sew, and only then to accommodate my regular customers, she went on, a bright colour staining her faded cheeks. If I want to do a kindness for folks, I guess I can do it without being slapped in the face, and me a member in good and regular standing. The innocent offenders stood stupefied, aghast. The girl began a hurried search through her phrase book, while the man rumpled his hair, which was somewhat long and curling and frosted lightly with silver, with a gesture of despair. Alas, he murmured, I am inconsolable. Too little, too much, or not at all, I ask you. But why, why would you derange yourself for us, not of your country? Miss Malvina's wrath suddenly vanished into thin air. That's so, she chuckled. A body ought to keep in mind constant. You can't help being foreign. As far as being deranged, insanity don't run in our family, so you needn't be scared. I get mad quick, but it don't last no time. 
I see you don't know better, so we'll call it square. We call it square? But what is square, dear Miss Malvina? entreated Madeleine. It is of a friendly, n'est-ce pas? Oh, good land, yes, laughed the little dressmaker, her dignified complacency quite restored. Oh, you're enough to kill corn, the two of you, but I guess you mean all right. In the chill dusk of the April evening, while ashes of violet and rose still mingled in the west, Miss Malvina sped like a shadow under the budding elms. In a flat parcel under her arm was the brown and purple robe, substantially stitched and conscientiously finished. Mrs. Hobbs, still environed with the as yet inchoate creations of her genius, welcomed her with unaffected emotion. I've put in a terrible day, she confessed, what with ladies telephoning and coming in droves to talk over styles. You say this is all finished? Well, I'll look it over as soon as I get a chance, and let your friend know if she's to send for more. But Miss Malvina stiffened her spine, in a valiant effort not to notice the heaps of silk and lengths of trimming which littered the chairs and tables. "'You'll look it over and pay for it now, right down in my hand, same as you promised,' she said firmly. "'I don't know as anybody could say much for the looks of that there robe of Mrs. Dickness Buckthorn's, but won't fall to pieces first time she puts it on, and the plackets won't bust out neither. And it be evened up around the bottom. Why, sakes alive, Miss Hobbs, that hem was three inches wide in the front of the skirt and two and a quarter in the back, and the hooks and eyes on the waist didn't no more jibe than anything. I could have done better than that at dress meeting when I was ten years old. Mrs. Hobbs chafed her reddened nose with a breadth of cambric. "'I hope you haven't spoiled the hang of the skirt,' she said fretfully. "'Spoiled? Me spoiled?' echoed Miss Malvina indignantly. Then she took refuge in a fit of coughing. "'Of course I know who you are,' pursued Mrs. Hobbs. "'I asked Mrs. Salter today, and she told me.' Hm, "'I ain't ashamed to be knowed.' stated Miss Malvina. I came up here in the first place, like the children of Israel went in the promised land, to see what sort of a shop you kept, and whether you was going to freeze me out permanent. And the minute I laid eyes on this here robe, I quit worrying. What do you mean? inquired Mrs. Hobbs feebly. Just what I say. I ain't a worried a mite. "'Twon't be no time before they'll all be back a pestering me for some real sewing. "'These here throw-together robes ain't a-going to take in this here town, I know. "'I've sewed for em off and on for thirty years.' "'I wonder you dare talk to me like that,' almost whimpered Mrs. Hobbs, with a vain effort after dignity. "'All my clientele admire my superior taste.' Miss Bennet gazed at her rival pityingly. "'I'm real sorry for you,' she said. "'Honest I be.' "'Sorry for me? Why, my good woman! I know. I'll tell you why. You can't hold this here trade with the kind of work you're doing. It'll peter out on you in no time.' Mrs. Hobbs fingered her frizzes with an assumption of ease she was far from feeling. "'I never heard of such a thing as a person like you,' she stammered. "'It's the most extraordinary idea.' "'Well, I'll tell you, Miss Hobbs, I got kind of desperate. What with losing all my customers and the rent and groceries running behind, I got Ma Bennett to do for. Ma's going on seventy-nine. She come to live with me last winter after my brother died. She ain't got nobody but me now. And thinks I, oh, I got to do something right off. Oh, you'd laugh if I was to tell you how scared I was to come up them stairs the first time. If you'd have been a roaring rhinoceros, I couldn't have felt more shrinking. <laughs> Mrs. Hobbs moved restlessly in her chair. Oh, you can go on right on sewing. "'Don't mind me,' said Miss Bennet kindly. 
I'd really like to see how your superior taste will work out on that there green costume, the one on the figure. But as I was saying, I just took the bit in my teeth and tromped on all my most sacred feelings. Now I see you ain't no better off than I be, for all your gilt sign and your madam and your heaps of work. I ain't got enough work and you got too much. If I whirl in and help you out, same as we talked last night, me a doing real honest sewing like folks round here are used to, you may last out quite a spell. If you don't, well... Miss Bennet's eloquent hands disclaimed all further responsibility for Mrs. Hobbs' career. "'You certainly have got nerve,' murmured the new dressmaker, but she said it almost admiringly. "'So've you,' returned Miss Bennet promptly, "'or you wouldn't be here.' The two women stared at each other fixedly for an instant, and then Mrs. Hobbs' watery gaze fell. "'You want I should pay you for this?' she inquired uncertainly. "'Mm-hmm. And give me some more work. I got to live while I'm waiting." This ominous reference to the future appeared to galvanise Madame Louise into action. She arose and fetched a plethoric purse. "'How much do I owe you?' she hesitated. "'I mean, how long? We agreed by the day, didn't we?' I put in five hours steady, stated Miss Malvina. So it comes to a dollar and a half, even money. That robe's all ready to send home, as much as it ever will be this side of Jordan. Oh, it'll be real enjoyable to see Miss Buckthorn come sailing down the center aisle with it on. <laughs> the clash of the three silver half dollars was music in Miss Malvina's ears as she sped homeward, clasping a great parcel of work in her thin little arms. "'Ain't I glad I stepped on my pride and roused my grit and gumption,' she said to herself. "'Twon't be no time before I can hold up my head with the best of em, and all my bills paid and money laid by. And if that ain't a lot better than sitting around crying over spilt milk, my name ain't Malvina Bennett.' End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Young Harry Schwartz whistled pleasantly to himself as he applied a liquid polish to the body of his automobile, which, under the further urge of his muscular arms, assumed a specious semblance of newness. It was a second-hand car of humble origin, and the young man, contrary to the advice of his prudent parents, had just taken one hundred and twenty-five dollars from his modest savings to pay for it. "'Harry,' said a voice from an open window close at hand, "'is that my new dustcloth you're using? I've been looking for it everywhere.' The young man grinned. "'Shouldn't wonder, Ma,' he confessed. "'Is this it?' with doodaddles in pink worked around the edge. Crabbed it from a bag behind the door. Just the thing for polishing. Say, Ma, come on out and view the fliver. She sure is some car. Mrs. Schwartz presently emerged from the back door, an apron over her head. She was a pretty, fair-haired little woman, and her big son gazed down at her with an amused smile. What are you going to do with me, Mamma? "'Spat my hands,' he inquired good-humouredly. "'I had a sneaking notion I was appropriating something valuable. "'But I was in a hurry. "'I got the knock out of the engine, and she runs like a breeze now. "'You want a ride?' "'Oh, Harry, just look at the grease spots on your new clothes,' wailed his mother. "'Why didn't you put on your overalls?' The young man surveyed his stalwart person with smiling unconcern. "'That's nothing,' he said rather grandly. "'Gas'll take it out. Run in and get your coat and we'll take a spin. I want you to hear her purr.' But Mrs. Schwartz shook her head. "'She had a cake in the oven,' she said. 
besides there was the week's mending to attend to she stood for a minute gazing about her a proud light of happiness in her eyes in the rear was the garden already ploughed in anticipation of fresh vegetables and a harvest of gay annuals then there was the house its upper story covered with weathered shingles its clapboards below freshly painted a light brown trimmed with white everything she looked upon was spotlessly neat and all their own even the window panes glittered in the bleak sunshine she had just washed them and the shades were pulled to the precise middle of the sash beneath them one caught glimpses of fresh muslin curtains there was a bay window at the side with a yellow canary singing shrilly and a flourishing rubber plant which had been treated to its weekly bath of milk and water a narrow concrete walk led around the house to the front where it joined a wide expanse of the same useful substance which conducted one neatly to the street the schwartz house was almost exactly like four other houses in the immediate neighbourhood on other streets not far distant were similar structures all with shingled second stories narrow front porches and jutting bay windows and such is the solidarity of human nature this very similarity added a fine savour of complacency to mrs schwartz's reflections any one could see theirs was a new house by merely looking at it and there were so many old houses in innisfield indeed it was only lately that the young boston architect with plans which seemed so nearly to fit the average income had come to innisfield there was also the building and loan association a convenient bridge between inchoate ambition and its fulfilment harry worked for the building and loan hence the savings and the second-hand car after all nothing of what she saw would have mattered much if it were not for harry her fond maternal gaze rested upon her one surviving child as he bent to his task he was a handsome lad other people beside his mother said so and she was never tired of contemplating his ruddy complexion his light curling hair and his frank blue eyes all of which fittingly crowned a good six feet of muscular well-developed body as she closed the door of her kitchen upon the pleasant picture of her boy trundling slowly out to the street his face as shining as the newly polished car she fondly reviewed her ambitions for harry's future he was to go on working and laying up money till he had enough to buy a building lot she had her eye on one already not a stone's throw from the family dwelling on this lot harry would with the aid of the building and loan association build a house with a shingle top story a bay window a front porch and cement walks inside there would be of course a reception hall a parlour with a dining room just the back of it both rooms closely associated with the kitchen by a butler's pantry she believed harry should have hot water heat instead of steam it sounded more elegant and expensive somehow but for the rest his house should be precisely like all the other half shingled houses a few of which were distinguished by red or green roofs it cost more to have a coloured roof and the brilliant tints of the freshly stained shingles had a provoking tendency to fade to the same dull hue of untreated roofs but if harry wanted a red or green roof he should have one mrs schwartz took her cake from the oven it was in three layers and baked to a delicate brown by the time she had built her three layers into a perfect structure with chocolate frosting which harry liked she had come to the difficult matter of choosing harry's wife the little woman wrinkled her forehead and pursed up her lips as she passed the girls of harry's age in critical review not one of them seemed to entirely fill the requirements it was natural for harry to want to marry a pretty girl but having conceded this much to the unthinking masculine nature mrs schwartz could not help reflecting on the well-known fact that pretty girls as a rule are far less fitted to the domestic treadmill than their plainer sisters they were more apt to be idle vain and fond of a good time 
it was impossible to think of her son's new house presided over by a woman of that sort harry's always been used to having things just so mused mrs schwartz as she set her cake to cool in close proximity to a lemon pie topped by a fabulous meringue and he never could stand it any other way as she washed her hands at the sink she resolved to guard harry against the machinations of certain young ladies whom she forbore to name to herself but who none the less appeared to threaten peaceful possession of her idol harry's a good boy she told herself proudly he'll never go against his mother when it comes to getting married and anyway there isn't any hurry then she took her basket of mending and sat down in the bay window to darn stockings complacently aware of the hard-won order and immaculate saturday cleanliness of her small domain and of the two dollars and thirty-nine cents that she'd contrived to save from her housekeeping allowance that week unconsciously her small blond face took on the look of a flower tightly closed against the sun after its one day of blossoming no more the rendezvous of wandering bee or vagrant butterfly but secretly and exclusively occupied with its own concerns in the meantime young harry schwartz had driven his car straight down the main street of innisfield with a fine expansive joy welling up within him and overflowing in smiles on his handsome ruddy face with his cap pushed well back on his crisp hair he grasped the steering wheel with both hands his eyes fixed on the road which appeared to leap forward to meet him that several of his acquaintances stopped to stare after him he guessed rather than saw he had never driven a car before and it was necessary to give his entire attention to the matter after a while he had been told it would become as easy as riding a bicycle easier indeed he was wondering if he could turn the thing around as the houses slipped away from him on either side in a very few minutes he was clear of the village on the narrow country road which led between farmlands substantially fenced to a crossroads dividing the valley in half he reflected he could easily turn his machine around at the intersection of the two roads it was then that he saw a woman's figure walking slowly toward the sunset she would of course get out of his way when she heard the car approaching to his surprise she did nothing of the sort he reached for his horn which gave forth a feeble honk and then trod savagely on everything in sight things happened swiftly and consecutively after that the car essayed nimbly to leap the stone wall failing in this it turned squarely around and toppled over on its side where it gasped and rattled convulsively its owner rather white and shaken climbed out over the uppermost wheel he wasn't even scratched for which miracle he should have been devoutly grateful instead he was conscious only of an immense and growing indignation with the cause of the disaster he finally succeeded in quieting the sputtering engine after which he turned upon the girl who stood quite still her hands clasped her eyes wide with terror and dismay well said the young man what the dickens why didn't you get out of the way he must have loomed very tall and threatening and for all his youthful good looks a terrifying sort of figure for the girl slowly backed away from him without attempting a reply you must be deaf and dumb he went on still hotly didn't you hear me blow my horn the girl essayed to speak failed and then without a further glance at him turned and walked swiftly away harry schwartz stared after her open-mouthed he was beginning to realize dazedly two things he had first been too shaken and angry to notice the first was that she was extraordinarily and vividly pretty for all her pallor second he'd never seen her before Whew but she's some sprinter he muttered and forthwith broke into a long stride which brought him abreast of the culprit what's the idea in running away so fast miss uh, he propounded mendaciously he added i may need your help you know 
the girl flashed him a dark glance you are one rude person she said calmly you understand me huh? sans raison bête what's that cried the young man oh say i i like that you like it eh <laughs> eh bien i not like it absolument but you should have gotten out of the road i honked all right i might have been killed you know the girl made no reply and after a perplexed silence he went on oh, well maybe you didn't know any better i guess you're a stranger of some sort of foreigner eh hey? she surveyed him haughtily from under her lashes i promenade myself pour des oeufs frais what you call eggs and me i thank you for not smash harry schwartz stared then he threw back his head and laughed wholeheartedly by george he exclaimed i must go back and see what i have to thank you for but it's strictly up to you to help me set the fliver on her feet don't you know the girl listened attentively to this speech a little puzzled frown puckering her white forehead strictly up to you she repeated me i not know the colour had come back to lips and cheeks and she smiled revealing adorable dimples in the corner of her mouth he gazed down at her with a growing sense of wonder say where did you come from he asked i never saw you before you sure are one beaut he added confident of not being understood she glanced back at the prostrate automobile and then at its owner a tardy sense of compunction dawning in her eyes i aid you she propounded sweetly oh i don't know he said feeling suddenly ashamed of himself the fact is i'm a greenhorn at driving i should have stopped until you got past the crossroads i meant to have turned around there you fix moi aussi she offered confidently oui she had turned squarely about and was hurrying back toward the scene of the disaster young harry schwartz followed i suppose she's teetotally on the bum he murmured disconsolately first time i had her out too the girl bestowed her precious basket under a bush voila we oui, make it she said eagerly well i don't know about that he doubted i don't want to muss her up any more than i can help he gazed ruefully at his treasure and then he saw that she was valiantly dragging a rail from the fence oh i say that's too much for you oh i get you put a lever under her eh? oh guess you're right ten minutes later the little car stood squarely on its four wheels once more a trifle scratched to be sure its mudguard bent but on the whole vindicating the modest claims of its maker then harry schwartz quite forgot the girl in the all-engrossing business of examining the mechanism under the hood of his machine when he finally glanced up she disappeared and neither vista of the country road afforded so much as a flutter of her blue skirts well i like that he exclaimed disgustedly and i didn't even find out her name end of chapter eight chapter nine of neighbours by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain the rev silas pettibone attired in his second best preaching clothes dedicated to parish visiting and rainy day funerals bent to kiss his wife good-bye he was not a demonstrative man and heretofore his caresses had been of a sparse and meagre nature commensurate with the dignified reserve of his character but there was something about the glorified face of his wife in these early days of her motherhood which seemed to draw kisses as the sun is said to draw water when it sends earthward long luminous rays from behind an effulgent cloud curtain mrs pettibone was wearing the blue negligee adorned with cascades of white lace upon which malvina bennett had lavished the pent-up poetry of her lone maidenhood 
she looked very small and delicate in the shabby old rocking chair and no one but the most discerning would have identified the inert flannel bundle in her arms as a real live baby i suppose i ought to put him down the minute he goes to sleep she apologized having accepted his kiss with the slight tinge of maidenly embarrassment she had never quite lost according to the book my dear you should put him down before he goes to sleep offered mr pettibone drawing on his gloves you're looking remarkably sweet today miss Fulura, he added with the total irrelevance she'd noticed in him of late she blushed becomingly but if he should cry she temporized haven't you learned by this time that it is the inalienable right of the infant to cry he asked how else shall he strengthen his lungs expand his diaphragm and kittens don't cry she said stoutly nor nice little roly-poly puppies nor little birds their mothers cuddle them all the while and feed them whenever they like a cat a dog or a fowl of the air in any stage of its existence he reminded her gravely could hardly be compared with a human being but she merely cuddled the flannel bundle closer and murmured something in which he caught the words precious lamb as for sheep and their offspring he went on still argumentatively one should really silas she interrupted him did you pay miss malvina for making this wrapper did i pay miss malvina oh, he rumpled his hair i have no remembrance oh let me recall miss bennett brought that very becoming garment to the parsonage the day of the advent when such trifles as clothes and money were far from my thoughts as far i venture to say as from jacob the morning after he had wrestled with the angel and received his new name no my dear i did not pay miss malvina then won't you go there to-day silas do you know i'm afraid poor miss malvina is being quite cut out by the new dressmaker the new dressmaker uh, um i was not aware over trimmer's store don't you remember we were going to call only i oh yes yes i fear i have laid myself open to a charge of neglect of parochial duties during these last weeks but now that you are well, now that i have you safe and the baby she put in touching her lips to the fraction of a downy head which peeped out from the blankets oh the baby of course <laughs> now that i have you both quite safe and reasonably established in health i must and there is the new family in my house too and mrs salter with another of her spells oh, quite right quite right my dear now if you will allow me to bestow our son in his crib i will go you should rest till tea-time he left her rather hastily at last having inadvertently waked up the baby who began at once to exercise his inalienable human rights as differentiated from the animal creation he decided to call upon the new dressmaker first after looking in for a moment upon brother george trimmer in his place of business though not a shrewd man in the secular sense the minister had not infrequently been led to meditate upon the singular metamorphosis which came over various members of his flock at the dawning of the sabbath on a sunday morning elder trimmer was invariably to be found in his pew in church attired sombrely in a long-tailed coat once decreed by fashion as the habit of a worldly society and now by universal consent the garb of piety with his sunday clothes brother trimmer in common with other members of mr pettibone's congregation habitually assumed an expression of superior sanctity when he walked down the aisle with the collection plate and when he stood before the pulpit awaiting the minister's benediction on the perfunctory pennies and nickels representing innisfield's benevolent impulses 
the beholders could scarcely help but notice the sleekness with which his sparse hair had been brushed the whiteness of his starched linen and the solemn squeak of his sabbath shoes elder george trimmer was an indispensable pillar in the house of his god and he knew it without his support and presence the cause in innisfield would assuredly languish if not completely collapse the knowledge of this fact lent force and cogency to his utterances more particularly when he conversed with his pastor on the present occasion mr trimmer was entrenched behind his desk when mr pettibone called and from this stronghold he vouchsafed the briefest of nods and an inarticulate growl of recognition i see you're busy brother trimmer said the minister politely i will call again mr trimmer waved his hand with some impatience oh sit down sit down sir he said i'll see you in a minute i've something to say to you mr pettibone declined to avail himself of the indicated chair oh i have a small commission for mrs pettibone he recollected i'll attend to that first if you please the minister's experienced eye had caught sight of a new clerk in the shoe department as he threaded his way among the bargain-laden tables in the aisles he continued to examine the face of the stranger the young man unaware of his approach stood with folded arms staring at the wall of yellow shoe-boxes which confronted him but it was evident to the most casual observer that his attention was not focused upon the stock of footwear in the trimmer dry goods emporium it was a handsome though rather sullen face with sternly compressed lips and a deep fold between the grey eyes which turned in response to mr pettibone's question slippers yes sir what size oh uh, something soft and becoming in a light blue particularized mr pettibone ah for a lady inferred the young man what size did you say sir oh uh, oh as to that i'm afraid i neglected to inquire the lady is small and slender better have the lady come in and try them on sir if you don't know the size mr pettibone shook his head oh, that would be impossible for some weeks yet i fear the lady is uh, <clears throat> at present she is unable to leave the house why not bring in one of the lady's shoes then suggested mr trimmer's clerk scanning his customer with faint amusement you are a stranger in innisfield i believe interpolated mr pettibone i don't remember to have seen you before haven't been here long admitted the young man his brooding eyes sought a distant window with an expression vaguely suggestive of a wild creature unexpectedly trapped ah permit me to introduce myself said the minister pleasantly i am mr pettibone pastor of the presbyterian church here we shall be glad to make you welcome uh, what was your last place of residence the young man hurriedly replaced the cover on a half-open box london he replied briefly oh indeed commented the minister oh i recall there is a town by that name in a neighbouring county am i to understand the handsome sullen face flushed darkly i mean england he jerked out i was born there oh, well well exclaimed mr pettibone with unaffected surprise we are all interested rather particularly interested i may say in your native land at this time are you uh, you have been here some time i suppose a matter of six months replied the young man the dark flush had crept up to the roots of his hair he stared defiantly at mr pettibone then you don't care to buy anything to-day sir this was clearly a rebuff but the minister inured to reprisals of the kind persevered i should be glad of your name and address uh, i'll look at those slippers again in, in just a moment 
you will perhaps know what size small ladies usually wear the minister had taken a notebook and pencil from his pocket and stood waiting with the smile many people found quite irresistible the young englishman shrugged his shoulders my name's hobbs he said unwillingly kitchener hobbs mr pettibone glancing up quickly caught the look which accompanied the simple statement it puzzled him named for the great soldier eh oh, sad thing for england his death very unfortunate it would seem and your address i live upstairs with my mother with your mother oh i was not aware mr hobbs showed no lively interest in mr pettibone's bewilderment he had pulled down and opened several boxes containing felt slippers something like this sir he inquired civilly enough in size three maybe or four mr pettibone restored his memorandum book to his pocket and focused his short-sighted eyes upon a pair of pale blue slippers adorned with fluffy pom-poms and a lavish display of satin ribbon hmm. these look about the thing he said measuring the dainty trifle thoughtfully upon his outspread palm her feet are slender and not much larger than a child's you say your mother um mrs hobbs am i right she calls herself madame louise growled the young fellow she's a dressmaker oh yes yes oh now i place you said mr pettibone as he searched his pockets for a certain thin roll of bills he appeared not to notice the extreme reluctance of the reply yet all the while he was keenly aware of it and of the deepening of the frown between the sombre young eyes now why the minister asked himself as he strode away the pale blue slippers safely bestowed in his pocket why should this young man secure from the perils and hardships of war and one would say reasonably well placed in business and for what does he wear the look of a soul tormented end of chapter nine chapter ten of neighbours by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain it being mr pettibone's particular business to search out the answers to such questions he proceeded at once to call upon mrs hobbs who chose to call herself madame louise though for what purpose he could only vaguely surmise as he applied his gloved knuckles to the door bearing the flourishing gold script of mystery it occurred to the minister that he had neglected to avail himself of mr trimmer's invitation or was it a command to return to the office he knew from past experience that he would later be obliged to pay for this omission elder trimmer's temper being none of the best on any day of the week then the door opened and he became at once absorbed in the business of his calling as it happened mrs hobbs establishment was at the moment free from her numerous patrons she therefore received the minister graciously betraying little of the surprise she felt at his visit on his part mr pettibone after begging the lady to go on with her avocation which at the moment appeared to concern itself with an intricate arrangement of cord and buttons on a bodice of peculiar shape and colour seated himself and gazed kindly at his hostess i have just had the pleasure of meeting your son he began he tells me he is a native of england a flicker of mrs hobbs eyelids and the sudden snap of her needle prefaced her reply yes sir but i am an american i was born in boston oh murmured mr pettibone aware of a slight bristling as of defiant feathers and were you long a resident of england mrs hobbs shot a furtive glance at her questioner what she saw was a man of dignified presence well on in middle life his hair of iron grey swept carelessly back from a broad forehead his eyes keen yet kindly and his mouth slightly humorous and his chin square and firm the women of his parish for the most part liked mr pettibone 
they found it a comfort to tell him their trials and perplexities his advice and his sympathy were alike welcome i used to go to the unitarian church before i was married offered mrs hobbs after a slight pause during which she set several random stitches in her work but after we moved to the old country i got confirmed my husband was a churchman there was a pride of a sort in the statement and a veiled protest which reached its mark if you are an episcopalian said mr pettibone hastily i shall not presume to urge the claims of my own church upon you it is my custom however to call upon all newcomers for the purpose of ascertaining their church affiliations more than once i am glad to tell you i have been able to be of service in the way of finding a church home for strangers well we ain't been to church since we came back to america stated mrs hobbs hoddy he don't care much for church and i well i've been kind of busy the woman's expression appeared to shut the door upon further inquiry mr pettibone paused to reflect the memory of the gloomy young face below stairs recurring to his mind most people need friends he said persuasively and i'll venture to tell you mrs hobbs that i couldn't help seeing that your son he paused to choose his words with care well in short he struck me as being depressed perhaps i would better say harassed over something young men interest me strongly i have a son myself growing up the woman's stiff features unbent in a smile your son ain't so very old is he <laughs> if you're the mr pettibone i've heard my customers tell about in the shop the minister's pale face became suffused with youthful colour but he achieved his reply with creditable dignity well, the, uh, <clears throat> the fact that my son is still in his infancy does not impugn my statement he said strongly if a young person of either sex is unhappy that person is in my opinion liable to peculiar temptation mrs hobbs shrugged her shoulders well i don't know as i mind telling you what ails my boy she said he was set and determined on going to war ah the monosyllable exhaled mildly from the minister's lips expressed his sudden illumination tinged with a certain inchoate sympathy mrs hobbs glanced at him suspiciously her needle like a slim dagger poised in air i guess you wouldn't want your boy put down in a nasty muddy trench to be fired at she said oh no said mr pettibone drawing his brows together oh no i should not and yet for goodness sake i hope you ain't going to encourage him in any such foolishness cried mrs hobbs with sudden sharpness it was all i could do to coax him over here to america where he'd be safe i got down on my knees to my own child i did and even then he wouldn't have come but the doctor said i had heart trouble and was liable to die most any minute if i got excited mr pettibone gazed at the woman with strong kindness in his eyes but he offered no comment on what she had said after a moment of silence she went on i'm willing to work my fingers to the bone for hoddy and he knows it yet all he thinks about day and night is getting back to england i guess he wants to get killed leave me alone her voice trailed off in a sob she wiped her eyes on the gaudy garment she was fashioning but i tell him i'll jab a hatpin through my heart before i let him go and i will too i am not going to give up my son to any old king or czar why should i i'm an american is your husband i, I suppose mr hobbs is not living mr pettibone's voice like his eyes conveyed his perplexed compassion well said mrs hobbs after a pause i call myself a widow but i don't know whether hobbs is dead or alive i don't care so much either he was a seafaring man he never came back from his last voyage they said he deserted in a china port 
but folks have a way of disappearing in those parts and you never can tell that was years ago the minister nodded thoughtfully i see i see he murmured you have only your boy the sudden passion of mother love which flared up in the woman's sallow face startled him it was as if the sun had suddenly burst forth upon a sodden landscape glorifying it to an evanescent splendour and yet she only said with a sigh hoddy's always been a good boy he seems an intelligent fellow mr pettibone recollected vaguely it occurred to him that he should be going in order to compass the other visits he had planned he's had the best of schooling mrs hobbs said proudly i had a shop in london sir hobbs set me up in a small way for fear as he said something might happen to him when the war broke out my boy was nearly through the london technical school he'd have finished in another six months but when it came to enlisting for the war and talk of conscription i sold out and came straight home i guess i had a right to come home i wasn't no londoner and my boy's american if he was born on the other side he wouldn't acknowledge it said mr pettibone as he rose to go he told me his name was kitchener hobbs that was his father's doings mrs hobbs said fretfully i wanted to call him george washington but my husband was a britisher through and through he named him horatio herbert kitchener she followed her visitor to the door trailing dropped spools and lengths of scarlet cord behind her i don't want my affairs talked about she said as the minister shook her limp hand at parting we want to keep to ourselves and not bother with anybody me and hoddy i can't say what possessed me to tell you what i did but if you could keep hoddy's mind off soldiering i might maybe you can trust my discretion madam mr pettibone assured her and i shall be glad of another opportunity of talking with your boy the sun was near its setting as the minister walked slowly down the long village street his hands folded loosely behind him he noted abstractedly the bands of pale yellow and amethyst deepening to dull crimson which made of the arched vista of naked boughs a groined window more splendid than that of any cathedral he was thinking over his late interview with mrs hobbs and in the light of it interpreting albeit in a somewhat sober and middle-aged fashion the look he had seen on the face of george trimmer's shoe clerk it was difficult for mr pettibone to comprehend the position of the young englishman yet in spite of himself he found his sympathy going out to him rather than to the woman i cannot approve of warfare mused mr pettibone shaking his head warfare is uncivilized degrading even brutalizing and yet no woman has the right to strangle the convictions of a man he was still pondering these paradoxical conclusions when he arrived before the rather dilapidated cottage bearing the brilliantly new sign of malvina bennett dressmaker end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Old Mrs. Bennet opened the door in response to Mr. Pettibone's knock. She was a very small and withered old woman with bent shoulders, which appeared in some remote period of time to have absorbed the semblance of a neck. She peered suspiciously at the minister over the rims of her old fashioned steel spectacles i guess you'd better step inside she said the air drawer is something terrible when the door is open the pent-up atmosphere within the little house appeared to be clamouring for reinforcements in it were reminiscences of boiled vegetables fried things kerosene feather beds of ancient lineage and descent of well-conserved black clothes and old stuffed furniture with the more insistent aroma of a chill cellar 
where lingered the ghosts of vegetables, pickles, and smoked meats. Old Mrs. Bennet blinked vaguely at the tall man in the dimly lighted passage. "'Be you the sewing machine agent?' she demanded in her high, quavering voice. "'Because if you be, Malviny says—' "'Pardon me, Mrs. Bennet,' the minister interrupted in his unruffled voice. "'I see you fail to remember me. "'I'm Mr. Pettibone, a pastor of the Presbyterian Church. "'I had the pleasure of calling upon you last winter.' Oh, well, that certainly is one on me, crowed the old lady. Oh, Malviny, Malviny. The sound of a sewing machine driven at full speed ceased at the strident call, and Miss Bennet's voice issued from the stuffy little room in the rear of the hall. What is it, Ma? Here's the minister come to call, and I went and mistook him for the sewing machine agent. Miss Malvina, instant with apology and explanation, piloted Mr. Pettibone to the parlour, where a sofa and several chairs covered with black haircloth presided over a marble-topped table, whose chief ornament was a symbolic cross, wrought in waxwork in the days of Miss Malvina's youth, and carefully guarded from the tooth of time by a glass cover. "'Mars, I say, ain't so very good lately,' offered Miss Malvina, my sewing machine makes such a racket i can't hear myself think i suppose you're busy as usual chimed in the minister cheerfully he was thinking his wife must have been mistaken about the new dressmaker surely there should be enough work in innisfield for both women i suppose mary philura oh i mean mrs reverend pettibone must have told you she said in a low tone, not meant for the ears of Ma. "'Oh, you mean—' Miss Malvina nodded and hitched her chair closer to the minister's. "'I've kept it from Ma so far. I don't want her to get all riled up. You know how it is with a person her age. Of course, I ain't talking about it to most other folks neither. But that there Madame Louise, well, I don't mind telling my minister— She's took my customers right away from me. Folks I've done for since they was babies. Oh, this is really distressing, Miss Malvina, said the minister. And to think that all this time I've neglected... Oh, you perhaps recall the circumstances connected with your bringing Mrs. Pettibone's robe, if that is the proper term for so beautiful a garment, to the parsonage. He had drawn the depleted roll of bills from his pocket and was gazing at Miss Bennet, his kind face puckered with distress. The little dressmaker threw herself back in her chair with a tragic gesture of dismay. Oh, if I ain't always a puttin' my foot in, she exclaimed. Ma, seems to me I smell them turnips burning. Put some more water in the pot, will you? On the heels of Mrs. Bennet's departure, her daughter turned again to the minister. I ain't a going to take a cent for making that there negligee, she said positively. Tain't much I can do for folks. But making up them light blue goods for Mrs. Reverend Pettibone was a real pleasure, and sewing on the lace and all. I kept a thinking all the while how perfectly sweet she was going to look, holding her baby up against them satin bows. Oh, I hope and pray he don't spoil em. Oh, but my dear Miss Malvina, protested Mr. Pettibone, let me assure you, that while we appreciate to the full your oh, i didn't tell you everything interrupted the little dressmaker the lord's been real good to me and i'm so prosperous and contented as a mouse in a cheese i tell you i just took the bit in my teeth and went and interviewed that woman you mean mrs hobbs miss malvina nodded briskly she can't no more dress make than a cat can sing. I'm helping her out. You're helping? I'm finishing off and like that. But I don't take no responsibility on my shoulders for patterns. And of all the ridiculous... 
oh, just you wait till you see miss obed salter and mrs undertaker beals a walking down the centre aisle a sunday i bet you forget your text oh, but there <laughs> i oughtn't to have spoken that away mrs bennett sailed into the room her ancient nose in the air next time you want to get rid of me malviny she said you don't need to tell no lie them turnips weren't even boiling mr pettibone arose with haste oh uh, <clears throat> can you tell me anything concerning your new neighbours he asked i had thought of calling there well i should remark <laughs> chirruped miss malvina i feel as though i know em intimate what with helping em clean and settle and madeline running in the back door friendly most any minute i am teaching her to talk so folks can understand what she's trying to say oh i had to laugh first off but she's real bright and catches on something wonderful her pa can talk pretty good considering he's foreign of course he can't help that oh yes sir mr desay is what i call a real gentleman and outside of present company there ain't many of them to be found in this ere town mr pettibone walked home quickly in the early darkness which greeted him as he emerged upon the old familiar doorstep of the house which had sheltered the sober late blooming of his second courtship and marriage he seldom thought of his first wife in these days many years had elapsed since he believed his broken heart buried deep beneath the rough sod of the village churchyard and in truth something of himself his young manhood his shattered dreams of future happiness the fervent upspringing of his spirit to hers had never risen from the chill silence which enshrouded her there but to-day a look in the soft dark eyes of madeleine de say something in the graceful bend of her head as she sat modestly listening to the somewhat laboured conversation between her father and himself had brought back the vivid image of mary and now as he hurried homeward she seemed flitting by his side in the deepening twilight as beautiful as loving as when in her first youth she had given herself to him he half put out his hand to the unsubstantial presence then as quickly withdrew it there was no bridging of the chasm possible and were it possible he knew he would not choose to call her back the mother of his son sat waiting for him by the study fire there was a warm rose of welcome in her uplifted face which vanished at the touch of his cold lips what has happened silas she asked quickly you look pale and oh nothing nothing at all my dear philura he assured her it's damp and chilly outside and uh, well i believe i am a little tired parish visiting is never an easy task she watched him anxiously while they were eating their supper and uneasily aware of her searching eyes he made a conscious effort to entertain her telling her of mrs hobbs and her english son of the generosity of malvina bennett at which she demurred and finally of his visit to the desays she presently forgot her uneasiness in eager questions about the father and the daughter the furnishing of the house and the probable permanency of her new tenants if only they'll stay all summer silas we can buy the ford runabout you could sell the horse and buggy and the barn will do perfectly just as it is oh it would be such a help in out-of-town calls dear he did not deny this and the curious sense of aloofness which she had felt like a chill mist between them gradually disappeared in the sunshine of renewed domesticity that frenchman de say he told her is a most interesting person it seems he's a native of alsace and at the outbreak of the war fearing reprisals from his german neighbours with whom he'd never been on the best of terms he decided wisely or unwisely to come to america they have some small means i should say but whether they will remain in innisfield or not depends wholly upon circumstances 
you mean whether they like it here or not she inquired precisely my dear and that as the boys say is up to us he still seemed struggling with some unknown depression difficult to shake off her eyes timidly questioned his but without response then they are not catholics he shook his head such religion as they have bears no theological brand he said dryly and you're quite sure you feel well silas he arose from the supper-table with his usual dignified deliberation my dear philura he said why will you persist in supposing me ill isn't it one of your bedrock principles to think health she lowered her eyes yes silas she said meekly he worked diligently in his study that evening covering uncounted large pages with a dissertation on the life and labours of st paul garnered from the shelves of his library and the recesses of his own well-stored mind it was past eleven o'clock when he finally placed the cap sheaf of a triumphant martyrdom on the apostolic career the house was very quiet so quiet that the soft thud of snow against the window was distinctly audible he arose crossed the floor noiselessly in his slippered feet and looked out all semblance of spring had vanished in the whirling drift it might have been january and yet it was april and all this show and bluster of winter must shortly disappear before the advancing sun half against his will his thoughts reverted once more to the reverie of the early evening and his subsequent discomfiture under the blue eyes of philura was it a species of infidelity to her to return to his lost mary even in memory he swept his hand across his tired eyes life was a strange long journey at best and one must travel it for the most part alone with only thoughts unseen unknown and often unbidden for company a faint wailing cry from above roused him and then the sound of her gentle foot on the floor was the response of the infinite affection as sure end of chapter 11 chapter 12 of neighbours by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain if etienne de say had ever regretted his hastily formed decision to immigrate to america he never confessed it to his daughter madeline he had likewise refrained from telling her what unspeakable things he feared in the land of their nativity he contented himself with praising america it was a safe place he declared for persons like themselves being far removed from the tumult and dangers of war and withal hospitable to strangers one might have supposed from listening to the worthy gentleman's dissertations on the land of his adoption that the splendid song of the nativity had been composed and rendered by angelic choirs solely or at least chiefly for the town of boston it was here that the wanderers first found refuge and where for a matter of six months they remained living in a dark ill-ventilated flat in south boston a locality which was they discovered shortly as different as could be well imagined from any city town or village of france rents were high provisions of an unthinkable expense and service impossible to procure it was during these initial weeks that madeline a mere child up to this time became the practical woman of affairs she learned to market and to cook and the touch of her light hand kept all things clean and well ordered or so it seemed to her father who knew nothing of the hours his child spent in noiseless dusting and polishing while he slept rousing for his chocolate when madeline brought it steaming to his bedside in the first days of spring when bunches of wilted violets and the rarer arbutus began to be hawked about the streets the girl begged for the country this american town is very ugly mon père she said piteously and in the summer this apartment will be too warm under its roof of tin i think also 
of a street named milk m desaye raised abstracted eyes from the book in which he had buried his regrets you wish again to remove he inquired mildly but where do you not find these rooms sufficiently commodious it is true that the town is ugly but what would you we are far from france he shrugged his shoulders resignedly madeleine explained even in america one might find trees and grass of a sort she stated there were also small cottages where one might dwell in localities where eggs and vegetables could be procured of an indubitable freshness her young eyes were eager her cheeks flushed with hope it is probable that m desaye would have continued to occupy the dreary little flat in south boston without thought of change since in the privacy of his own mind he had already condemned america and in particular boston as a most undesirable place of residence he had made a mistake he told himself to be somehow endured till the war was at an end he would then return to france settle in some unmolested village where in good time he would arrange a suitable marriage for his daughter during the months or years which must necessarily elapse before this desirable denouement he had his beloved books and for the rest little mattered but he was a good father mindful when not too absorbed in his literary pursuits of his motherless child so the brief conversation resulted in various pilgrimages to more or less ugly suburbs where the rents were of a highness and finally by the merest chance to a town further away amid real trees and fields with country roads and farms not far distant here was a vacant house with the sun looking in through its small paned windows here also were shade trees shrubs plenty of space for flowers in beds and borders and best of all an indubitable apple tree with promise of abundant fruitage already visible on its gnarled boughs here madeleine a fresher rose blooming in her cheeks was presently singing about her work which appeared less irksome than in the ugly city rooms and here also m desaye once more content resigned himself to the narcotic soothing of his books satisfied that when the proper time arrived for the marriage of madeleine the dove of peace would be brooding his distracted country he even permitted himself to hope that his beloved alsace might be restored to france with all her drooping lilies freshened into new beauty but of this soaring aspiration he said nothing bitterly realizing the teuton prowess even in american towns and villages one's eyes and ears were constantly assailed by uncouth german names and the dissonant speech of the foe but what would you it was always possible to avoid such persons cochon m desaye characterized them under indignant breath which epithet as a matter of course is to be metaphorically interpreted as for the americans as it pleased the english-speaking inhabitants of this crude almost barbaric country to call themselves one might spend a not unprofitable period in studying their strange customs to this end m desaye applied himself with some diligence to the mastery of the english tongue it was a bet of a language being entirely lacking in the facile grace of the french but again what would you the few the very few persons he had met in america who professed to speak his own language accomplished such excruciating torture of his sensitive ears that he begged them almost with tears to desist your pardon madame or oh, monsieur as the case might be but i will speak to you l'anglais he would say with dignity there was a certain fat blank book reposing in m desaye's escritoire on which from time to time he wrote in careful french his impressions of the natives of america somewhere in the back of his brain lurked the secret aspiration of one day achieving a literary reputation 
and why not begin with these deliberate and profound studies of foreign life as he was now beholding it miss malvina bennett was very far from realizing the sort of interest she had aroused in her neighbor but she found a new zest in living as the spring advanced and the yard next door began to bud and blossom under the intelligent care of the desays it was pleasant to sit by her low window-sill which afforded a convenient resting-place for spools buttons and other properties of her trade and likewise commanded a sweeping view of the neighbouring garden and front porch he's a settin out on the stoop this morning with his book as usual she would tell her mother and madeline's got her dish towels spread on the barberry bush to dry now she's digging her poses do you ever see the beat of them too and ma bennett would draw her far-seeing specks over her faded eyes and gaze and gaze at the spectacle of m desaye in a frogged velvet coat slowly turning the pages of his book and of the light figure of the girl coming and going in her pink cotton frock land malviny she would say if he ain't started up to come over here again what in creation ye want this time o day not being in the secret of the fat blank book which by now boasted several pages covered with exquisite script recording the writer's impressions of une couturière d'armerique miss malvina could only speculate vaguely as to the motives which brought her neighbour so frequently to her door after one or two occasions devoted to ceremonial interviews in the haircloth parlour miss malvina decided not to make company of the gentleman from foreign parts tain't as if he was a regular man she told ma he's different from the men folks round here as chalk is from cheese and having arrived at this sagacious conclusion miss malvina fell into the easy habit of permitting m desaye and his daughter the freedom of the kitchen where she kept her sewing machine during the months when fire was a necessity sit right down in the rocking chair she would say hospitably i can stitch up this ere seam in two jerks of a lamb's tail and then we can talk on a radiant afternoon in early may behold them thus miss malvina industriously binding the seams of a robe destined to enhance the fading charms of mrs obed salter ma sleepily knitting while the cat played with her ball of yarn under the table and m desaye paying diligent heed to the little dressmaker's fluent conversation after various unsuccessful attempts to master her frequent and remarkable figures of speech m desaye had concluded that english was a vastly more malleable language than he had at first supposed it he now resorted to the socratic method miss malvina he observed blandly i have heard you speak of two jerk of the tail of the lamb i have in my dictionnaire earnestly sought those words but as yet i do not comprehend the meaning you will of your kindness tell me if i also should speak those words and on what occasion miss bennett gazed pityingly at her visitor he was a personable figure of a man though regrettably foreign in his appearance even his garments though well fitting and of fine material did not in the least resemble american store clothes his eyes very dark and keen appeared to emit occasional sparkles of disconcerting mirth miss malvina sniffed tentatively mm, i don't know as i ever give the subject any earnest consideration she said thoughtfully you ain't obliged to say it but won't hurt you none to learn to talk like civilized folks voila he exclaimed eagerly that is what i wish to speak quite correct you will teach me eh? he smiled engagingly the corners of his upturned moustache lending an agreeable emphasis to his words i shall learn n'est-ce pas in one two jerk of a lamb tail eh? do i say exactement miss malvina cackled oh you certainly do beat the dutch she exclaimed but you might as well leave the pa and ma off your remarks maybe i'd better turn to and learn french 
I says to Madeline yesterday, Bonsoir, I says, just like that. You ought to have heard her laugh. Monsieur Desaye looked pained. My daughter is young, excessivement, and what you call foolish, he said. He shook his head. Do not, I beg, attempt to speak our language. It is too... Uh, oh, no, tain't so bad as I thought first off, interrupted Miss Malvina kindly. I bet I'll be parley vooing as well as the next one before you know it. It would be kind of fun, I think. Me and Madeline's getting along first rate. I'm learning her so she'll be up to snuff in no time. Up to snuff, repeated Monsieur Desay. What is that word most interessant? Miss Malvina, two pins firmly clenched between her teeth, paused to survey a twisting seam. Up the snuff is what you ain't, she said cruelly. But there, I guess that wasn't so very nice of me, seeing as you ain't in no ways to blame for being French. If the truth was knowed, maybe that's just what ails Miss Hobbs, a trying to be furrin when she ain't. If I couldn't do no better than that on a dress waist, I'd eat my best bonnet. Ah, it is idiom, n'est-ce pas? Eat my best bonnet. All idiom, I think. Ah, very great of interest, oui. He wrote briskly in a leather-covered memorandum book, while Miss Malvina bent her mind upon the intricate problem of the misshapen seam. Malviny, said Ma Bennett, who had suddenly come to life in the act of rescuing her ball of yarn from the cat. I see Madeline out there, talking to a young man over the fence. Looks me like Harry Schwartz. Mm, yes, tis, confirmed Miss Malvina placidly. Well, Harry's a real nice young feller, and his folks has got money. I'd like to see Madeline with a likely bow. She's a good girl and pretty as a pink. M. Desay darted an inquiring look toward his own menage. Then he arose, restored the memorandum book to his pocket without apparent haste, and approached Ma Bennett, as was his invariable procedure on arrival and departure. Madame, said he, heels together, hand over his heart, mes compliments. I am excessivement oblige for your hospitalité. Oh, land sakes, don't mention it protested Ma. No one, as far as she could remember, had ever paid her the slightest deference. It gave her an added sense of self-importance which she found singularly agreeable. Permettez-moi, continued the Frenchman, still more politely, as he restored the disputed ball of yarn to its lawful owner. Miss Malvina dropped her work in her lap, and with a subdued sparkle under her lids, awaited her own particular leave-taking. It was customarily not less ceremonial than that accorded to Ma, but with a barely perceptible shade of difference, an added savour of esteem, apparent to Miss Malvina alone. Today, to her surprise, Monsieur Desay retreated nimbly toward the door. Miss Malvina, adieu. Uh, my thanks, my compliment, was all he said, as he backed out of the door, in perfect form. Well, did you ever? sniffed the little dressmaker, visibly dismayed. Seems like he's in a hurry, observed Ma sagaciously. Maybe he's got his eye on Madeline's bow. And then again, maybe he's mad at something or other. I wouldn't get too familiar with a foreigner if I was you, Malviny. They ain't to be trusted. But Miss Malvina's sewing machine opposed a noisy whirr of defiance to Ma's unfounded opinions. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Neighbours by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Madeleine de Say, in her pink cotton gown the colour of a rose, a rare tint which appeared to be reflected more richly in her glowing face, was still talking, or was it merely listening, to the tall young man on the further side of the fence, when M. de Say, with no undue appearance of haste, joined his daughter. 
one might have supposed he had at that moment first perceived the stalwart person of the intruder so genuine and unaffected was his surprise oh monsieur he murmured gently possess the advantage is it not i have not the plaisir no the girl turned quickly and in the act a wave of crimson submerged the warm rose of her cheek oh she breathed quite and yet not quite as an american girl would have spoken the small word signifying surprise and pleasure or was it merely dismay the young man's head was bare and the wind blew his curly brown hair about his blue eyes which were frankly occupied with the girl to the exclusion of all else but at the tactful interruption meant without doubt to hold a shade of reproof he glanced up oh, your father he asked cheerfully oh, glad to know you sir i had the pleasure of meeting mr say some weeks ago perhaps she told you of the spill of the spill echoed the older man still bland but unsmiling i fear i do not understand this word is not familiar and you he turned to his daughter you have not introduced my madeleine where par exemple is your civilité his playful manner took all the sting from his words or so young harry schwartz was thinking he was therefore quite unprepared for what followed uh, permit me to present to my father uh, monsieur monsieur henri lenoir she said breathlessly and flashed a pleading glance at the partner of her late adventure ah monsieur de say's voice held quick relief undisguised satisfaction mingled with cautious reserve but the sort of reserve which is ready to melt into complete cordiality a compatriote monsieur i grasp your hand with great pleasure harry schwartz understood and took instant advantage of the proffered hand the rapidly spoken french phrase troubled him he shook his head regretfully i didn't learn much french in school he acknowledged ah oh, voila you are american born i perceive monsieur de say's tone expressed keen regret but my friend you should learn the language hereditaire it is great pity such ignorance forgive if i speak without disguise of sentiment the young man drew his frank brows together in a puzzled frown he was trying with small success to comprehend not merely m de say's halting english but the singular sea change which had come over his own honest name why had madeleine he already thought of her as madeleine called him le noir in the meantime it appeared necessary to say the right thing if one could by any means be sure of it to this insistent person in the frogged velvet coat i'm awfully sorry i'm such an ignoramus he blurted out but i guess i could make a stab at french if i put my mind to it i wish uh, couldn't you teach me sir i'd study like a nailer i vow i would it was a credit to m de say's quick wits as well as to his recent studies in the singular english idioms that he grasped the import of this speech his grave face brightened i am not professor of french language and literature he stated with dignity still to oblige a compatriot who will sans doute acquire his own language with ease i shall have the most great plaisir you will begin immediately n'est-ce pas i will cause you to forget the fact lamentable that you are born american oh i say murmured the astonished recipient of this magnificent offer you are a lot too good sir oh but i'm afraid i he stole a look at the girl she was apparently intent upon the spray of lilac bloom she was slowly denuding of its florets upon the melting rose of her cheek the dark lashes cast a distracting shadow about the corners of her mouth an elusive dimple came and went well if you think i could learn sir i was never very good at latin oh certainement cried m de say with some impatience 
not for nothing have you the sang froid to speak to my daughter <laughs> allons i now present to you book you shall also learn many things most necessary for polite he held the gate wide and harry schwartz entered his brow still corrugated with unaccustomed thought madeleine raised her eyes for an instant but she did not smile he even thought he detected a shade of displeasure in the look she bent upon him as he lingered behind the impetuous frenchman who had dashed into the house in quest of the initial medium of instruction what's the matter with my name he inquired did you forget it she surveyed him disdainfully from under her lashes stupid she murmured not for you do i your so ugly name transfer to most beautiful francais but for my father who hate a detest such german word you understand oui? never do i again speak to you if you oh you bet i won't he promised eagerly i'm not so slow i get you okay but say you won't mind if i take your father up on that proposition will you i am keen to learn french always wanted to honest injun i'll study evenings oh, madeleine smiled inscrutably also i learn to speak english she said very quick i learn miss malvina teach me many things in two jerks of lamb tail you see you mean the old maid dressmaker next door he asked incredulously is she teaching you english madeleine nodded mon père aussi we are most interested we study idiom like you eat my best bonnet <laughs> mon dieu me i find your english not gentil but most risible what do you call funny <laughs> i bet dollar i learn more quick than you my star alive yes <clears throat> you sure are making some progress agreed the young man cheerfully but i can teach you too i'll bet i can knock the spots out of miss malvina when it comes to idioms i know em all <laughs> you knock the spots of miss malvina it is most rude a knock oh, knock the spots is an idiom it means oh, i can lay all over miss malvina when it comes to teaching you good plain american i can beat her hollow or beat her to a frazzle means the same thing she's old-fashioned old fashion yes behind the times not up to date you want to hitch your wagon to a star that's me and young harry schwartz grinned audaciously we also have idiom she informed him you shall see but mon père has discovered book of learning he is not glad for me to talk to you why not i flattered myself your father cotton to me she swept him a quaint curtsey good-bye i make myself of a sudden scurse like teeth of hen quick absent uh, you understand by the living jingo mused harry schwartz as he walked away ten minutes later a copy of fenelon's telemachus under his arm if she isn't a perfect peach is little henri in luck oh, you can just bet he is and he tossed m desaye's treasured fenelon into the air and caught it again to the imminent peril of its old world binding End of chapter thirteen